The State and Future of Television, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today to talk about the rapidly changing state of television and its future are associate professors in the School of Communication and Media, Tara George and Hugh Kernut. Prior to coming to Montclair State, Tara was an associate professor of journalism at Purchase College, State University of New York. Her journalism career stretches from London to New York, and Tara worked for many years as a reporter for the New York Daily News. She is also a contributing author of the book, Brooklyn, A State of Mind. Hugh works in the areas of critical media and cultural studies, researching the evolution of communication technologies and the shifting intersection of media producers and consumers. One of his main focuses is exploring the constant changing landscape of television. Welcome Hugh and Tara. I think it's safe to say as we frame our conversation today, this is in some ways the best of times and worst of times in television, especially from an academic's point of view. Constant change is always good for the study of media, and certainly television is changing rapidly. The best of times, maybe, Hugh, because television entertainment has rarely been as interesting as, and diverse as it is today. The worst of times, maybe, Tara, you study news and teach news, Television news in many ways has never been worse than it is today, and I think we can start our conversation with those two premises. Hugh, you agree television entertainment maybe is as good as it's ever been, if not better? Um, in some ways, absolutely. I think there are a number of um, scripted programs today that uh, really excel at storytelling, and I think that the sorts of attention they've gotten um, show that audiences are enjoying them in ways they don't oftentimes think about enjoying television. Uh, for example, oftentimes uh, we think of television as being something that is um, maybe of less value and some of the programming we're seeing today uh, because of different economic models and evolving technologies um, allow for a kind of storytelling and production value that looks more and more filmic, right? So for example, you'll have someone like David Fincher who would make um, you know, movies move into television in a way that he couldn't before. Tell us about Fincher for those who don't know his work. So David Fincher, um, I'm a big fan of, and he makes um, a number of, of sort of, he's made a number of thrillers. Seven is probably my favorite. It's more of a horror story, I guess. But anyway, um, he is a big part of making House of Cards, right? And you can see in the production of House of Cards a lot of the same sorts of uh, values, right, and techniques that you would see in a film, right? Things like lighting, storytelling, um, and more importantly, I think a kind of richness uh, that oftentimes uh, people would not attribute to television, even if it was in television. In would you agree periods. that there's more quality television on today than at any given point, certainly in quantity? Not necessarily. Um, I think it depends on where you look and what kind of television you're looking at. Um, I think that a lot of the TV uh, that we see today on cable television um, which starts to happen as we transition from a network model to a post-network model or post-network environment. Um, you'll see more and more reality television, more and more nonfiction programming, which not necessarily is bad, but um, it is far more um, formulaic and based on format duplication. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the same thing. I would say that it's an evolving uh, environment and that's what makes it very dynamic. Um, but I think it's hard to say that it is a great time or a terrible time. You know, I think it depends really on what you're looking at and what you enjoy watching. So the premise of my point, Tara, about television news was, of course, there is a great lament for the good old days of television news, which by most measures weren't so good, but still there is this lament. Cable news is characterized by more opinion than journalism these days. Broadcast television news weakening because of its economic model. What do you think? What's your take on television news in 2015? Well, I think television news has its work cut out for it, as does news across all platforms. 
Um, I think the future of television news um, is in some ways not on television at all, but um, arguably on smartphones. Um, television news stations are um, trying to capture audiences on television, on the web, um, through social media, and um, increasingly, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to catch younger audiences through their, their phones, which is where the, the audiences are at. I think it's an interesting time. There's innovation in news, um, but I think to some extent television has been, um, television news has been less able to interact with the audiences the way that audiences are demanding to be um, interacted with on television. When you note that the number one cable news network, um, Fox News, has a very clear point of view about the news, does that, is that troubling? Is that exciting because it's engaging? How do you react to the success of Fox, at least circa 2015? Um, well, I think, um, I think the success of Fox speaks to uh, a possible future trend where um, an, an older audience is, is sitting down and watching news on television. Um, and that news that they're watching in the evening is, in a way, a way of finding out what happened on Twitter earlier on in the day. <clears throat> um, so I think the people who are tuning into Fox News that want opinion, um, and they've already heard the news, that they know it, and now they want to sort of, in a way, have their um, ideas about the world reinforced by what they see in opinion on the news. Hugh, you have a point of view about the success of opinion as redefining what cable news is today? I, I mean, I, when I think about cable news, I do think of it very much as something where it's reinforcing uh, a sort of worldview that's already been shaped by the news of the day. Um, and, and one of the most interesting, I think, examples of this, which gets talked about a lot, is the sort of um, way in which The Daily Show or satirical news programming on Comedy Central works in a similar vein. So, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things people talk about when they think of The Daily Show is they say, well, it's the number one newsmaker for, or provider for um, a more cynical, savvy generation. Um, but what a lot of research has shown is that the people who tune into The Daily Show are already heavy consumers of news. And that's part of how they can get the show. They're familiar enough with the sorts of opinionated um, uh, news programming, right or left, that precedes it on MSNBC or Fox, um, or sometimes, unfortunately, on CNN, which doesn't really break either way and maybe loses out in that sort of struggle, and then they enjoy that sort of satire. So I think very much cable news television um, tends to be more opinion-based, uh, not always. And of course, when it's breaking news, uh, it, it can be a real resource. As um, media is changing, it seems that the redefinition of television and the digitization, if you will, of television finally is upon it, upon us. People have been wondering for years when television was really going to start to change. And I think we're here now largely because the living room or the family room set has now been turned into an internet device. It took a while for that to happen. There are lots of starts, stops and starts in that, that regard. But finally, we're there, right? Amazon, Google. Um, Apple are all really important players in television now for a variety of reasons. And that's, an op that's either a curse or a blessing. How does this moment in time and that historic change strike you, Hugh? I, I think it's very exciting. And I think that um, it's, it's a moment when we want to we wanna sort of see how these changes are going to happen, but also look at the ways in which um, the sort of cultural protocols that go along with watching television uh, will inform what kinds of TV we watch and where we watch it. So this is a, th a moment when, you know, uh, you're right, we move away from this kind of very centralized viewing habit, oftentimes um, located in domesticity, the home. Although you'd also see televisions and bars and restaurants and things like this. Um, and it gets decentralized to the point where the technology is cheap and you can wire the house, you can watch TV all over your house. And now, of course, you can carry around a device um, that allows you to watch television wherever you are. I see students watching their favorite programs or programs they enjoy um, in the halls of the, uni the university. Excuse me. Um, and so I, I think that this sort of decentralization with our devices is allowing for a kind of viewing experience that we didn't used to have. Um, at the same time, I think that the kinds of viewing experiences that we like to have, uh, where we do watch together, where we do watch in either our homes or our kitchens, will remain. Tara, how does the cha this change in television and these big players coming into it, you called it the decentralization, how does it strike you from your perch? 
Um, in terms of television news, yeah. I would say, um, well, the, the subscription model is kind of on the rise in a way in television. And I think advertising dollars are therefore heading towards mobile. Um, one of my students held up in class the other day um, a Snapchat app and showed the class uh, news stories that were on that app. And in a way, they are the way they're formatted are very much like television, where um, a choice has been made by an editor what to feature on on that um, on the app for that day. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's very clever the way there, there's, there's a lot of innovation and, and uh, creative ways to try and figure out how to get TV to particularly young people on the phones that they're using, you know, all the time. It's a little bit ironic that we're talking about decentralization and more opportunity. At the same time, we're talking about companies with enormous market power moving into the category, right? These companies, Apple, Amazon, Google, for instance, dwarf in size and power, really, the television networks. You think about the market capitalization of those companies, their scale. When you think about issues like Amazon's ownership of the cloud and what that could mean um, in the context of the future of television. Is there anything troubling in all that and all this money and resource and power being devoted to television, Hugh? Uh, you know, I think this gets at a, a, a larger issue um, dealing with sort of what we oftentimes think of as the new media environment. And that's that there's a kind of egalitarian open space that because you can post something on YouTube, that you can somehow participate in the way that the media industry is able to participate with all of its influence. And I think it's telling that the moment when we do see a shift, right, when Amazon or Netflix says, we're gonna provide content, not from a media industry hub, right, we're not gonna take it from Sony, we'll make our own content, is when you see a media industry uh, uh, doing it, right, as opposed to um, something that's either publicly funded or something that is created by individuals uh, outside of this kind of area. Um, so I, th I think that that is a big part of the fact that we live in this kind of commercial media environment, which is dominated by media conglomerates. And so I guess you need another sort of large conglomerate or large company to come forward in order to make that kind of shift and that kind of change. Tara, either from a news or an entertainment point of view, does the market power of these players and the scale of all this change trouble you or excite you? It excites me. I feel like um, it raises the quality. I'm impressed when I watch TV. I think that in general, when I sit down to watch a television show, that it delivers. I, I have a good sense of what I want from it and that it delivers in a way that often is not true of um, the movies or a film. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be said in terms of just an increase in quality from all this interest in television. You mentioned Snapchat as a platform for news. Obviously, we have almost anything as a platform for news in theory in a world of user-generated content. What does all this user-generated content, content posted to YouTube or any place else by you, me, our friends, or our children, what does that mean in terms of journalism and verification, Tara? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, on, the, on the upside, it means that there's, there's a lot of interest um, from the general public in, in getting involved with news and chiming in and piling on and liking, and um, I, th I think that's good. But on the other hand, um, there's less time and less interest almost in really knowing whether the story is true. Um, and that's what journalism is all about, is you know, doing the reporting and making sure that the story is accurate before it goes um, to the public. And there's a lot more pressure um, on television news and, and news in general, not so much to um, get it first, but first get it right, but just to get it first. User-generated content, is that an entertainment or a content opportunity? Is it a threat? Is it exciting? Is it frightening? I think it's exciting for people who are working in the industry and haven't, let's say, established themselves. So, you know, you can, if you're, if you're a, um, a young professional in the industry, right, you're going into, um, maybe you're doing comedy writing, you want to put together sketches, you can do them and get them out there and then maybe that draws a certain amount of attention and then you get picked up and brought into the industry. So in this way, it's a kind of foray uh, into the industry that I think can be uh, very valuable. I also think it gives people who are within the industry a certain uh, flexibility where they can do kind of creative uh, projects that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. I mean, to a great extent, um, you know, the media industry works under a kind of logic of safety. 
So they don't want to produce content that is either something that's too out of the box or something that's unknown, especially because oftentimes it's debt financed. Um, and thinking about television, what's interesting about a subscription-based model is you're moving away from debt finance, right? Subscribers are paying up front for the content, and so that gives you a certain amount of flexibility in creating content that's more challenging, more innovative, um, maybe something people haven't seen before. So I think it all kind of works together. So we're all producers, right? And the distribution bottleneck that used to exist, the distribution being captured by big three networks 30 years ago, then cable, that's all gone, right? We can all be producers. We all carry phones. We're all capable of either producing on our phone or producing at a desktop with a Final Cut Pro kind of editing tool. So that problem is solved in some way. And now we can all test our sitcom ideas or our guitar playing ideas in some way that catches people's attention. But at the end of the day, to your point about formats, what every comic on YouTube really wants is a half an hour sitcom on NBC, right? I guess you'd have to ask the comic, but I think very much so. I mean, I think that's the progression, right? You can see a comic move from, let's say, stand-up uh, or some sort of writing job uh, into working on television, uh, working in a sketch comedy show like SNL, and then like someone like Amy Poehler, they transition into uh, making their own shows that are, of course, produced by Lauren Michaels. But it is ironic also in the context of all this change that the half an hour sitcom lives, the hour drama form lives, Netflix plays with House of Cards and cable plays at the level of, well, is it going to be 54 minutes tonight or 56 minutes tonight? But the fundamental verites and formats of television continue to thrive and we all seem to like them. Why is that? I, I think it goes back to the fact that um, whatever new technological opportunities we're seeing now, they still have to marry with certain cultural protocols that have grown up around television, the sorts of stories television has told us for decades and decades. And so, to a great extent, the people who are continuing to create this content work from that kind of fr frame of mind. So when they think of drama, they think of drama that's going to be about an hour. If they're shooting it for commercial television, it's going to be closer to 48 minutes. If they're doing it on HBO, they get a full hour because they don't have to worry about the commercials. But they think about the story in that kind of way. Um, there are tweaks, though, and differences, I think, uh, to these formats, which is um, in this current environment, there is a heavy reliance on serials. So television shows now, because people don't necessarily watch them uh, in real time, but they do a kind of binge viewing, or they at least have the flexibility to watch them uh, four, five, six at a time whenever they want, you can tell a story that's far more complicated. Whereas before, you couldn't do this because the show would never be able to run. People wouldn't be, a large broadcast audience wouldn't be able to watch it, right? So um, if, you're wa if you're watching a show that has a number of complicated characters and continuing storyline, um, and you jump into the show halfway through it, the seasons run, you're not gonna know what's going on and you wouldn't be able to go back and watch it. Now you can catch up and you can watch previous seasons and-, and the notion of binge is brand new, right? We didn't, it wasn't even a word in the television vernacular until fairly recently, right? No, it wasn't, it absolutely wasn't. I, but when I talk to my students about this, I remind them that storytelling and this sort of way of thinking about a serial narrative, right, and binging has existed for a long time, right? So people used to binge on novels at the beach in the summer, right? And now we have opportunities where people talk about television the same way. And as, uh, sorry, as, um, as rocky as things have gotten for television news, they aren't half as rocky as they are for newspapers, for example. N news TV has, has been remarkably robust if you compare it to newspapers. People are still going to TV for their news. Um, the question is, are young people going there for their news? When the um, Brian Williams scandal broke, I think I read somewhere that 7% of millennials knew who he was. Um, his average viewership, I think, is in the 40s. And O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, when that scandal broke, I remember reading that his average viewer's age was 72. Um, and the young, young folks just don't know who these people are. Right. <laughs> They're getting their news on their phones um, or you know, through their social networks. And um, you know, those trusted people of yore just uh, don't mean anything to them anymore. But yet to what Hughes' comments were about and this question of formats, Bill O'Reilly exists in an hour of television. Brian Williams and the Nightly News existed in a format of a traditional half hour. Do you see those formats ever changing or at least anytime soon? Um, I think they'll, they will remain intact and there will be some viewers who have grown up 
um, and are used to those formats and will stick with them. But I think the younger folks are going to find other formats that they like and their um, habits are going to develop that way and, and we'll see new models. So we, lots of us consume John Stewart uh, segments, by segments on our phone. I probably watch more of John Stewart and those kinds of programs on my phone than I do on my television. So that's one example of that. But where else might these formats go in news and information? Um, new forms of documentary, new forms of programs? Any thoughts yes. on that? Um, well, I, again, Snapchat comes to mind in that it, it is a new form. It's, um, it, it's not a sort of, sh it's not a social media kind of sharing model. It's more packaged out. Um, news that's been designed for the app um, and it seems like young people like it and the company I believe is valued at 19 billion at the moment um, which was surprising given that not too long ago they uh, rejected an offer f to be bought for 3 billion and everyone thought they were crazy and now they're you know the vanguard. Right. So in talking about the Snapchats of the world, you and mobile, do you see mobile changing formats or consumption patterns in any way? Or again, are we still going to be looking at our phones but still watching half hour sitcoms or hour long dramas? Well, I, I definitely think, um, you know, when we think about a phone working as a television, when it does so many other things for us at the same time, I think inevitably we're going to see content being produced that exists outside of these very strict 30 hour long uh, minute formats. So I, I wouldn't surprise me at all. I think it's going to be sort of a kind of combination where you might be watching um, on multiple screens one thing, right? So you're, you're watching the show on television at the same time maybe you're tweeting about it and or you're watching sort of bonus content material. So what the industry is going to try to do really is um, instead of thinking about the program as a discrete unit, they're going to try to expand the program and the program experience across a number of different platforms. Right? The idea is to drive you to a number of different platforms because you have those platforms and you're already paying attention to those platforms as opposed to thinking about it as a discrete hour of your time once a week. So you see the multi-screen phenomena watching television as at least I do and you probably do with another device in your hand or at least another device at your side. That's going to become more of a programming tool than simply, you know, a handy convenience? Oh, I, I absolutely think so. I think, well, I, I would imagine so and I think it already, you already see it moving in this direction from the ways in which you're able to access your television content, not just in terms of clicking on an app that will bring up HBO Go, or Amazon Prime, but you're also able to tap into your home television network um, and coordinate what shows you're going to watch, manage your DVR, uh, and or communicate with your friends about this content and share it. Um, so the distribution of the content is going to change uh, remarkably based on the fact that we're carrying around more and more sophisticated devices that can essentially network us. I think non-news television program has been very clever in um, recognizing that people, for example, want to um, watch the Grammys at home on, uh, on their own, but tweet about it with their network at the same time. Um, and I think it'll be a challenge for television news to figure out how to kind of access that model and get people integrated into their television news the way they are in other programming. Hugh, we still, though, get most of our television from the wire that comes into the house mm -hmm. from cable TV. The number is probably 90% or more, even as people are abandoning cable service, at least younger ones are, in the spirit of what's called cord cutting. Yes. Do you see cord cutting and people eliminating their cable subscriptions as accelerating, or is it something we just can't live without? I think, you know, I think the idea of cord cutting um, is an empowering idea, right? You get to say no more to, the, to a bundle of, pro, of, of channels that I never watch anyway. And, the, you know, and then I can sort of get this a la carte experience or I'll, I'll pick this channel, this channel, and this channel. But if we're going to get that through something like streaming, which I think is more and more the case, you're still going to have to pay for a broadband connection. And um, the streaming services might range anywhere from $6 per streaming service to $20, $25. So if the, the sort of liberating aspect of cord cutting and moving to the internet to um, source your television is that you, you're not connected financially in the same way that you were uh, to cable companies, I don't know that that's going to actually play out um, 
because to a great extent, these companies are figuring out ways to, um, you know, profit from this new environment. Or at least attempt to. Attempt to, yeah. T Tara, cord cutting, um, a real problem for cable television and news? Um, I, I don't know. When I hear that, I still think of the fact that even though I have a smartphone, many of us have for years, we still keep our landline telephones. So I think what happens is that one doesn't necessarily replace the other but you end up with multiple sources of either you know, phone access or television or whatever. One of the things I mean, I'm thinking about it in terms of news, um, you know, to a great extent what television does is it, or historically has done in the domestic space, is it's kind of given us a um, uh, temporal experience of the day. Right? You wake up and you turn on the television. Even if you're not watching it, the local news is in the background, you're making coffee, you're getting the kids ready to go to school, what, what have you. And I think that as much as there are these new media platforms that allow for discrete screenings of certain programs, people do like to have television keep them company in a lot of ways. And I think that if we're going to see this kind of shift, there's going to have to be a way to stream television so it embodies this kind of flow throughout the day. Um, which isn't to say that that's not happening, but I don't know that it, you're going to see it in terms of something like loading up uh, 10 hours of um, Game of Thrones and having that play in the background. Right? Tor, are you optimistic or pessimistic about all this? I'm optimistic. I think that, um, I think, you know, it's grounds for innovation and grounds for optimism, and we'll, we'll figure it out. You, optimist or pessimist? Optimist. Why? I enjoy television, and I think a lot of the content that's created is um, really great right now. And I think that with the opportunity to sort of shake up the industry, I think there's a better chance for uh, innovation. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with um, the media industry more broadly is because it is a commercial business, innovation is usually pushed back. It's done um, very infrequently, and it's seen as being you know, very risky. And so I think that the more players you have and the more opportunities you have to distribute content, I think that the chance for having innovative, more uh, diverse programming goes up. We will do this again in, in a year, perhaps. And I think we'll be talking about phenomena we haven't even contemplated today. Thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like more information about this episode of Carpe Diem or any other Carpe Diem, you can write us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.